So, <clears throat> thank you. The escalation of the situation on the ground is extremely worrying and appalling. The region is on the brink of a full-scale war and unprecedented humanitarian catastrophe. We unequivocally condemn the acts of extreme brutality, killings, and the horrifying scale, horrifying scale of violence. Any killings and violence against peaceful civilians, both Israeli and Palestinian citizens, is inadmissible. What happened on October 7 on Israeli territory is unacceptable. Israel, by all means, has the right to protect its own citizens. We also reiterate the right of Israel to ensure its security. However, there are two inseparable dimensions of the unfolding tragedy, and we can't highlight one and ignore the other. Indiscriminate shellings of residential areas in Gaza, cutting this territory from water and electricity, its blockade, which brings, which brings to our minds in particular the memories of the siege of Leningrad during the Second World War, are also unacceptable. There are human lives that matter most. Israel's actions of collective punishment of Gaza citizens, as well as its demands to evacuate more than one million civilians in 24 hours and concentrate them in a de facto ghetto in the south of the sector, are also unacceptable and can lead to irreversible catastrophic consequences regionally and globally. The root causes of this situation are of critical importance. Our Western colleagues do their best to promote the narrative that the current escalation happened out of the blue because a band of savage terrorists attacked Israeli civilians. The US, the US is especially insistent that the whole situation was unprovoked and Hamas are outcasts enjoying no support. If it were so, there would be no protests in the West Bank against Israel's actions and no widespread Arab and Muslim support for Palestine. We shouldn't ignore that the current flare-up of violence happens against the background of Israel's systematic violations of the decisions of the UN Security Council and the General Assembly, including the illegal expansion of settlements, which is regularly condemned by the vast majority of UN member states. We are all appalled by the fact that the Palestinians are being forcefully out, ousted from their land and their houses demolished. Any attempt to ignore this context is a clear manipulation of facts, which we cannot support. Let me be clear, the responsibility for the looming war in the Middle East, to a large extent, lies on the United States. It is Washington that recklessly and selfishly blocked the work of the Middle East Quartet of international mediators in an effort to monopolize the peace process and limit it to, Im imposing, to imposing an economic peace with Israel on the Palestinians and other Arab countries without solving the Palestinian question. We consistently warned against this, saying it will backfire one day. So it did. You all know well that for years the U.S. blocked any reaction, any signal from the U.N. Security Council, any modest call for exercising restraint, claiming that its quiet regional diplomacy is more effective. Well, now it is obvious that it has failed. In the current circumstances, Russia cannot accept the complete inaction and lack of any reaction on the part of the UN Security Council, as well as the UN Secretariat. As you could have noticed, not a single Western delegation called for an open meeting on the situation in the Middle East, while they use every fake pretext to call for the discussions of the situation in Ukraine for obvious political reasons. They are insisting to hold three monthly meetings on Syria to show that the Council is allegedly still preoccupied with this issue and to attack Syrian government, but they don't find courage to call for a meeting on the situation which is directly affecting international peace and security and has dire, immense humanitarian consequences. Against this background, our former Western partners are not hesitating to apply blatant double standards. The head of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen openly declares that the EU stands with Israel while turning a blind eye to the Israeli Air Force attacks on civilian infrastructure in the Gaza Strip. When Ms. von der Leyen commented on the situation around Mariupol in the past, which was not in any way similar to the one in Gaza, she said that, I quote, attacks against civilian infrastructure, especially electricity, are war crimes, 
and cutting of men, women, children of water and electricity are acts of pure terror, end of quote. There are more examples of the same double standards and irresponsible behavior of other, of, of other Western politicians. So what do we propose for the Council? We call for an immediate ceasefire and the prevention of further escalation, escalation of the conflict. We are convinced that the Security Council must act to put an end to the bloodshed and restart peace negotiations with a view to establishing a Palestinian state as it was supposed to do so long, so long ago. To this end, we are circulating a draft resolution of the UN Security Council, of the UN Security Council, which calls for an immediate, durable, and fully respected humanitarian ceasefire and for an unimpeded provision of humanitarian assistance, as well as condemns all violence and all acts of terrorism. This draft is open for sponsorship of all UN member states. Today, I have to advise you, there was a meeting of the uh, Commonwealth of Independent independent states foreign ministers in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, where they adopted uh, a joint statement, statement in that vein. It was circulated uh, as a document of the Security Council. We call on all the members of the international community to actively support, co-sponsor, and line up behind our draft. This is the only way to stop violence. As far as Russia is concerned, for us it is important to maintain contacts with the two sides. We have long established historical ties with Palestine as well as with Israel. A large number of our compatriots live both in Israel and Palestine. And this is also a very important factor that we have to take into account. At the same time, we have very solid, well-established, close relations with the Arab world, first of all with Palestine, which had been promised and mandated by the UN decisions, a sovereign statehood with the capital in East Jerusalem. These decisions have been taken by the UN Security Council and General Assembly, and they must be implemented. We stand ready for the mediation, and we have capacities for it, provided both sides are interested in it. I thank you. When do you expect, when do you expect to table the resolution? When do you have to turn to a vote? Okay, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, what did you hear also from? My name is Ibsam Azam, an Arab Jewish newspaper. First, when do you uh, expect to uh, to table the vote, for, to table the resolution for vote, and then we, we also presented the draft. We circulated the draft among the Security Council members, and uh, we asked for a uh, quite expedited uh, uh, deadline of, by 12 tomorrow, and we're expecting comments uh, coming to come from them to see where we'll go from there. How would you, how would you discuss Depend, this? Depends on the amendments. What do you think about the release of hostages? Would, would you ask to Hamas to release those hostages? The, the resolution provides, favor? there is a clause on the release of hostages there. What's the first reaction from uh, member states? Uh, some of them posi were positive on them, and some of them were a bit, uh, a bit uh, restrained, I would say. I, they didn't. They didn't say no, but uh, that, that's a process that we have to see how it will develop. Ambassador, Thank you very much. Your draft, your draft resolution doesn't actually mention Hamas. Is that something? Th this is a humanitarian agree? resolution, and this is not about about condemnation. The condemnation of the terrorism terrorism is there in the resolution, but uh, the, the focus of the, of the resolution is humanitarian, not political. Thank you very much.